perfectly silent. We didn't hear it at all. It just like swooped over our heads. And I guess they use stealth as part of their technique for grabbing howler monkeys out of treetops. So maybe that makes some sense. You know, when you watch movies like Hollywood movies and they show a bald eagle in the movie or a commercial or a TV show or whatever, the actual sound of a bald eagle sounds sort of pathetic to some people. It's kind of this little chirping like <laughs> So usually what you hear in movies, they get rid of that noise and they dub in the sound of a red-tailed hawk, which is the classic like fear, like this aggressive macho scream. And so that is what you hear when you see bald eagles on TV. <laughs> a little bit of a tangent there. <laughs> We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. Did the CIA write Wind of Change by the Scorpions? <laughs> <laughs> As humans busied themselves about the various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied. Dr. Loeb, what percentage chance do you give it that you have indeed uncovered extraterrestrial or non-human technology? With infinite complacence, people went about their affairs, yet across an immense ethereal gulf, intellects vast and unsympathetic through their plans against us. Prior to your abduction, did you believe in UFOs or any sort of alien life form? All things unexplained. So some of that I think there will save for close session. Hello, everybody. Welcome to All Things Unexplained. I am CJ Derringer, joined by my co-host, Dr. Mounts. Hey, Tim, how you doing? Good. How's it going tonight? Good. I just love that new intro. You did such a lovely job on that. Hey, that thanks. Really we are so excited to be joined by a world-renowned ornament ornithologist i had it right before the show darn it ornithologist which is tell us noah a studier of birds a bird expert what would be the true definition of that term oh an ornithologist is someone who studies birds for science but i think for me it's more of an all-consuming passion for life <laughs> <laughs> it sure seems that way so we've got noah stricker on the show and let me tell you we have been so excited to have him on for several months now. This has been a work in progress. We were supposed to have him on a while ago, and he was patient enough with us to reschedule. And every day up until now, Tim has called him the bird man. <laughs> he said, we've got the bird man coming on in September. We've got the bird man. So I asked him today, I was like, is that what he goes by? Or is that just what you call him? And I have actually seen in other areas, you have been called the bird man. Oh yeah, my license plate actually says, because uh, I got my driver's license when I was like 15, so it says B-R-D space B-O-Y. Oh. However, <laughs> on license plates, I gotta say an R is kind of square, so from a distance it sort of looks like an A. So it's, it looks like it says something else. <laughs> it looks like it says bad boy. <laughs> Bad boys, bad boys. <laughs> okay, that's amazing. And also that you still have boy on your license plate is Oh, that's good fun. If the beach boys can stay young forever, then so can yeah. bird boy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Bird boy it is. I love it. Well, we came to get to know Noah through a very strange way, though I suppose nothing is that strange on all things unexplained. As you guys know, we cover things like Bigfoot, alien abductions, UFOs, what have you. And one of our listeners sent us a sound that I believe it was a female that sent it to us who said, I, I recorded this outside of my house and I, I'm not sure what it is, but I'm going to give it 50, 50 chances, Bigfoot. <laughs> and, and Tim listened to it and said, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced Bigfoot to him. It sounded like a bird. So Tim, did you start researching bird experts and you, you came upon Noah? Is that how it all went down? Well, that's right. I mean, you know, you've heard of six degrees of separation, right? with um what's his face the actor kevin bacon kevin bacon right now and I, I found out he, he actually does you know he embraces that now he does a podcast called six degrees of separation with kevin bacon <laughs> where he just embraces it but anyway uh 
it only takes about two clicks to go from birdie expert on Google to Noah Stricker. So it didn't take long. It's not many degrees of separation there. As I tell my son, he's literally the Michael Jordan of birding. And so this lady that sent us the sound, she lives in, in Oregon and turns out Noah Stricker, the, the best birder in the world is, you know, in Oregon. And I was like, well, if anybody knows if this is a bird in Oregon, it would be him. And I could play the sound for us real quick. Yeah. Please. All right. Let's do it. Let's see what it sounds like. Okay, so Noah, expert opinion, bird or not bird? Well, first of all, I'll tell you what I'm not hearing in the background is any other birds on the recording, which is actually kind of unusual unless um, I would probably say this if recording has been taken at night when the only birds that are out there are like owls and night jars and stuff like that. It's a, it's a rare place anywhere in central Oregon, even if you're in the middle of a city, that you don't hear some kind of bird in the background. As for the foreground, I don't think it's a bird. I, I like to think that I kind of know my bird sounds in Oregon and I know what they're up to and what they're what they're trying to tell us and how they're introducing themselves. And I just, it doesn't sound like any kind of weird owl noise or night jar or, or any diurnal bird that I know. So I would guess that it's some kind of mammal. And, um, you know, when, when you say something is like a 50-50 chance of being Bigfoot, you're not, you cannot possibly be wrong because it's either one or the other. So. And that's music to our ears right there. I think, I think no, there. Is a chance. Considering there's a 50-50 chance this is a Bigfoot, we should hear it one more time. If, yeah. if I had to guess... it's It sounds like a distant dog barking in the night maybe to me having heard a lot of dogs while out looking for owls they can be very echoey like that but uh who knows <laughs> it could oh, be anything that's an interesting take <laughs> i not knowing my nighttime sounds very well i honestly thought maybe some kind of frog or to like i don't know no you're going no all right tim is it a bigfoot probably <laughs> That's that's my take. No, I really don't. I I don't think it's a Bigfoot based on uh, Bigfoot recordings. I've heard or purported Bigfoot recordings, but it, it could definitely be a dog or a squirrel. Like I said, I think people forget the incredible things that squirrels are capable of. And I hear squirrels in my backyard sometimes, and it sounds like World War Three. So. <laughs> it would be a squirrel, I think. It do make some funny sounds. You're right. Okay, well, that's not the real reason we brought Noah onto the show, though we do appreciate your input there. You are truly the go-to guy in birds. I mean, you've broken world records. You're on TED Talks. You're on NPR. You've written all of these books. You, you know so much about birds. But it had to all start somewhere, right? I mean, what was the original inspiration for your love of birding? Oh, well, for me, I blame my fifth grade teacher. She put a bird feeder on our classroom window. I guess you're like, what, 12, 13 in fifth grade? And she'd stop class every time a new bird showed up on this bird feeder on the window and have us try to identify what it was. <laughs> so it wasn't like I had friends who were into it or even like my family was into it. No, it was this totally random thing that I picked up in elementary school from my teacher. And then it's just a, it's a slippery slope of addiction after that. <laughs> <laughs> the slippery slope of addiction to birding i like <laughs> oh well i'm sure that your parents are far more proud of that addiction than other people's parents are of theirs however you um you mentioned that you're out at night a lot listening to birds in your area what is the most common bird sound that you hear at night when you're outdoors in oregon and are you willing to make the sound for us more importantly Oh, well, there is a, a, little, a small type of owl called a pygmy owl, which is only a few inches tall. I remember when I first saw one, I was still pretty little. It was on a logging road near my house, and they have false eye spots on the back of their head. So if they turn their head around, they actually have two black spots staring at you, which is sort of spooky. But they are active mostly at dawn and dusk, and they make a noise that's just kind of like a 
a repeated whistle. So it sounds sort of like they're saying. And then sometimes they get really excited and they go. The thing is other birds in the forest hate pygmy owls. And so when there's one around, they'll all come and they'll mob it and basically try to tell it, your cover is blown, go somewhere else. So if you can imitate a pygmy owl, then you can get all the other birds to come out of the trees and try to mob you and you can see what's around. So it's a useful sound to know. <laughs> That's brilliant. Okay, so have you done this? Have you successfully gotten birds to mob you in the middle of the night? Oh yeah, it was out there in the woods this morning being mobbed by chickadees and warblers. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. How often, other than when you're birding for professional purposes, are you truly just outside enjoying the birds around you? Uh, pretty much every day. I mean, I'm I'm traveling at least half of every year now on various expeditions and things. But even when I'm home, I try to get out, get my daily fill of fresh air and bird sounds. And, you know, there's only so long you can spend in front of a computer. That is for sure. Absolutely. Okay, well, we want to dive into all sorts of stories that you have and things that you have done. And um, I know that you have traveled the world, breaking the world record for the number of birds species seen in the course of 365 days. Has that record been broken since you did it? It has. I hate to break it to no! you. It broken the very <laughs> next year. So I'm no longer the world record holder. I'm second place. Ah, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised by that. Do, oh, were yeah. you the inspiration for the next person? Had they heard of you? And they were like, I'm, go I'm going after Noah Stricker. For sure. Yeah, it was um, uh, 2015. So several years ago now. A big year is when you set out and you try to see as many species of birds as you can in one calendar year between January and December. And people usually do a big year like in their home city or their home county or maybe their home state. If you're really crazy, you can take on a whole continent. In fact, there was this Hollywood movie that came out in 2011 called The Big Year with uh, Jack Black, Owen Wilson, and Steve Martin playing bird watchers, which I think is incredible that that even happened. <laughs> yeah. That was based on a true story of three guys who did a big year in North America a few years ago. But no one had ever really done a big year properly, I thought, worldwide. <laughs> and so that's what I set out to do in 2015. And I ended up spending 365 straight days birding in 41 different countries all around the world and ended up seeing a little over 6,000, 6,042 of the 10,000 or so birds in the world. Incredible. And what a wonderful way to also see the world. I mean, you have this task in mind, but you get to go and see all of these places that I'm certain you had not been to before. Maybe some you had, but um, what was one of the wildest experiences that you had while you were on that journey? Oh, I really wanted to see a bird called the Harpy Eagle which I don't know if you've ever heard of. It's the biggest raptor in the Western Hemisphere. It lives in huge areas of rainforest in South America and Central America. There's not too many of them left these days, but they're, they're massive. They're several feet tall. Their legs are as thick as your wrist. If they open their talons out, it's a big, as big around as a dinner plate. Their main diet in the rainforest is monkeys and sloths that they oh fly gosh. around and pick out of a treetop and carry back to their nest in a tree, which is like the size of a Volkswagen bus. So I really wanted to see this harpy eagle and uh, got to central Brazil. It was in February that year. And I had connected with the local birder who picked me up from the airport and we were going to go see what we could find. And he, he when he picked me up, he was like, I have staked out a harpy eagle nest that we're gonna go to at dawn tomorrow, which he never should have told me because I couldn't sleep at all that night. I just <laughs> lay in my bed, like tossing and turning and then got up again at 4 a.m. and we went out to this spot and sure enough, there's this massive platform of sticks that must have weighed a couple tons up in a tree. And then we sat there for like six hours and didn't see anything, <laughs> oh, no. waiting for this eagle to fly in until finally it was like, you know, the time was ticking. It was time for lunch. We got up to go and it literally picked that second to fly in this massive bird that was 
clutching half of a kawadi in its talons, this kind of raccoon-like tropical animal, which it proceeded to just shred on a branch of a tree in front of us for the next hour while we watched it with the spotting scope. It was fantastic. It was amazing. That was just one of the most incredible birds I've ever seen. Yeah, that sounds like a big bird. Do you think that it was waiting for you guys to move or leave? Is that why it didn't come back? Or was it just out hunting for that long? Is it typical for it to be gone from its nest for six hours? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, they've got to go get breakfast and sometimes it takes longer than others. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Do we have a slideshow, Tim, of some of those pictures from his trip or was that were the pictures from other experiences? Well, some were definitely of penguins in Antarctica, I believe, and some might have been from other experiences, but I can bring that up. I do have a question about the hawk, Noah. What did it sound like on the hunt? Did it did it make some sort of like extreme screech when it was hunting? Perfectly silent. We didn't hear it at all. It just like swooped over our heads. And I guess they use stealth as part of their technique for grabbing howler monkeys out of treetops. So maybe that makes some sense. But, you know, when you watch movies like Hollywood movies and they show a bald eagle in the movie or a commercial or a TV show or whatever, the actual sound of a bald eagle sounds sort of pathetic to some people. It's kind of this little chirping like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so usually what you hear in movies, they get rid of that noise and they dub in the sound of a red tailed hawk, which is the mm -hmm. classic like, Hear! like this aggressive macho scream. And so that is what you hear when you see bald eagles on TV. <laughs> a little bit of a tangent there. <laughs> That's funny. I actually think I knew that for some, I don't know why I knew that, but. Maybe from wild crats. Well, I, I remember yeah, seeing something about how a lot of the sounds that we hear on television and movies, and we associate them as reality, but they're not. So, Oh, that... it, don't get me started. This drives me nuts. Every movie you will ever see, some audio engineer has just thrown in whatever bird sounds they have on their hard drive, and it never is accurate. It never goes yeah. with the place where it's supposed to be taking place and the time of year and all the rest of it. It would be so easy to give them correct bird sounds. You know, they go to so much effort to get the perfect sound of a motor engine for a World War II fight scene or something. And then bird sounds is like, whatever, we'll just chuck this in there because it sounds nice to us. And so once you become a birder, it kind of like destroys watching Hollywood movies from forever after. <laughs> oh, like yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson and the stars in the sky, right? And, and the Titanic. <laughs> um, so did you hear that, Hollywood directors? Noah Stricker is available to consult on birding sounds for your locations that you're going to. Oh, seriously. Sure. If, if there's any audio people out there, send me an email. Yeah. I would be happy to consult. <laughs> yeah. Isn't there, is it Paramount Pictures? There's a movie studio where there's a lion in the beginning of the movie, every movie. It's like this big lion and it roars, but it's actually a tiger's roar dubbed over the uh, lion. Classic. <laughs> it might be MGM, but no, you oh, might, uh, it could be. I can't remember. I know it's, what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You've all seen it. No, you might it could be the other way around something for me. I, I don't really know, but we have a hulk in this neighborhood and it's routine for the whole neighborhood to hear it like screeching all around. And my theory is, and I have no idea if this is accurate or not, that it's doing this to frighten small animals into scurrying away somewhere and then boom, it's got them. But I have no idea if that's true or not. Why does a hawk scream? I don't know. They're probably trying to communicate with another hawk nearby, usually. But um, if you had the power to scream and make small animals scurry away in fear, yeah, you'd probably use it once in a while just for the heck of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. My children have the power to make adults scurry away in fear with their screams. So right. there's something to that. Like a cla sure. classic <laughs> television show we brought up on this podcast one time, Manimal. Do you remember that show, Noah, from the 80s, Manimal? Oh, that was a little before my time, I think. <laughs> I it, was this, it was this guy he could transform into any any animal. It just so happened the stock footage was mostly of a hawk, right? So he mostly transformed into a hawk and he did have that classic like you know screechy call and he kind of did it all the time so mm, well, <laughs> that is a question i've spent long hours thinking about like if you could be a bird in another life like you were reincarnated or something which one would you choose and i think 
After long consideration, people often say, oh, I want to be an eagle or a hawk or a bird of prey, but then you have to go around murdering poor defenseless animals all day. So I think I would be a wandering albatross, which is, wow. they have the longest wingspan of any bird in the world. It's like 11 feet from wingtip to wingtip, and they just spend their whole lives flying around the Southern Ocean, having a blast. They can live to be like 60, maybe 80 years old. But don't they eat fish? Well, they eat little <laughs> squid <laughs> and fish and stuff that floats up to the mm -hmm. surface. I mean, if you're a wandering albatross, I'm sure that's delicious. You probably wake up in the morning, yeah. you're like, mmm, fermented squid. I can't wait to eat that for breakfast. I see. <laughs> so you're not okay with murdering little mice, but murdering <laughs> fish are on board with I see. I get it. You're a pescatarian. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're okay with that. Fish is fine to be on the menu. Do we want to Since pull up we're that? on the topic of murders? Oh my. <laughs> I was going to say, one thing we've been dying to ask you about is, or I should say Tim's been dying to ask you about, is cattle mutilations. We have had a cattle mutilation expert come on our show, and so many people believe that these cattle mutilations are done by alien or you know supernatural forces, what have you. Tim believes, and many people believe, that the mutilation that's done to these dead cows could potentially be done also by the turkey vultures, right, Tim? Is that your theory? Well, that's right. Noah, I was just hoping that you could tell our audience a little bit about a, a great story I heard about you, is your fascination with turkey vultures and this experiment you did at one point in your life. Uh, well, I, I do have a very soft spot in my soul for turkey vultures. And I think it goes back to when I was in high school, like right after I got my driver's license, there was this TV show. I don't know if you remember David Attenborough did a show called Life of Birds, which is my favorite show of all time, obviously. And there was this there was an episode of it called Meat Eaters, where Sir David goes out into this rainforest. I think it was in Trinidad. And he has like this rotten piece of steak in his hands. And he starts talking about turkey vultures and then buries the steak under the leaf litter on the forest floor in the forest and then backs up and then they cut there and then they show like 40 minutes later this turkey vulture flying over and sailing down through the forest canopy and going right to the spot because it can smell that rotting meat from like two miles away they have an incredible sense of smell incredible. and dug it up and when i saw that as a sophomore in high school who had just inherited this 88 volvo sedan from his parents with a, a very large trunk that could fit a body in it <laughs> i was like oh man that is the best bird feeder idea i've ever seen and i went out and i found a roadkill deer carcass on like this hot august afternoon in western oregon outside of eugene and somehow single-handedly wrestled this thing into the trunk of my volvo and took it home and dumped it in the front yard and was like mom and dad i'm gonna see how many turkey vultures i can attract to our yard <laughs> And it worked amazingly well. The next day, we had like 40 vultures sitting on the roof of the oh house. Gosh. And they hung around like these ghoulish beings for the next week. It was glorious. And how much damage did they do to that deer? Oh, the deer was gone after a week. I, I, was, I put a little camouflage tarp out next to it so I could sit there and watch the vultures doing what they do. I mean, it smelled pretty bad, but it was fascinating <laughs> to see them. They are... Um, maybe a little more polite than you would imagine up close. They would almost have this pecking order of who gets to eat and then the next vulture and they were very shy. I would have to sit there dead still for half an hour before a vulture got up enough courage to come and start eating. But yeah, literally they they made some holes in the, in the carcass. They ate the eyeballs out and the gums out first because that was like the tastiest part, I guess, and then sort of went from there. And by a week later, it was just bones. That was all that was left. Interesting. And Noah, uh -huh. one thing I found fascinating is that you said there appear like I think when the majority of the population, and we've all seen turkey vultures on the side of the road, you know, on a carcass, and people I think tend to think that they just go at it, right? Like it's a pack of wild animals. But you, you seem to observe them in more of an orderly fashion. I can't think of another bird that is so common and abundant and a large bird species that you just see all the time. Turkey vultures are always flying around in the sky, soaring on thermals, that 
is also so secretive. I've only ever seen one turkey vulture nest in my entire life. And um, I can't think of another abundant big bird that I could say that. They just, they, they nest in like caves and hollow logs and foundations of old buildings way away from people. And they're super shy and secretive and tentative. And they're also silent. They're one of the only birds in the world that lacks a syrinx, which is like a bird voice box. So they can't actually physically make a noise except for sort of a hissing sound at their nest if you ever get that close. Although I don't recommend it because their main defense <laughs> at the nest is to vomit up whatever they have in their stomach, which is already oh. pretty nasty. <laughs> Might be worse yeah. than a skunk. Yeah, well, that's a, I would say that's pretty close, actually. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, now that you mention it, I have never visit. seen a turkey vulture nest. I never thought about that, though. Matter of fact, I think I just automatically assumed that, you know, how I see them, you know, CJ, we see them sometimes in these dead trees, mm -hmm. like a whole group of them, and they're what I take to be sunning in the sun or drying their feathers or something. I just kind of assume they're just in that dead tree at night in the yeah, same they, pose. They make communal roosts. They're actually kind of social. They hang out together in the evening, and they probably sleep in later than any other bird also because they have to wait for the sun to heat things up so they can start soaring on the thermal. So actually, you know, on consideration, it wouldn't be too bad to be reincarnated as a turkey vulture. <laughs> <laughs> you get to sleep in. Yeah, you sleep in and just sort of fly around all day and eat rotting eat. deer carcasses. It sounds great. Yeah. yeah, that's not so bad. Endless supply of food. And I mean, you never have to worry about it too much. But here's what it boils down to, Noah, for the cattle mutilations. So when a cattle is discovered on a ranch and we've got a tongue missing, we've got organs missing, we've got, let's say, lips and gums missing or what appears to have been, you know, like precise surgical precision type of operation going on. Is this potentially attributable to turkey vultures? Well, yeah, when you describe it like that, that actually fits pretty well with what I've seen them do to roadkill deer carcasses and things. They go for the the soft exposed parts first. So the eyes and the gums and and it's not really uh, totally chaotic. So that would maybe account for the surgical seeming quality of it as well. I don't know about inner organs. If, if selected organs are missing, I'm not sure turkey vultures could do that without making it obvious that they'd been in there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, they are the main scavenger in most of North America. So if you have a a ranch, you're probably going to have turkey vultures around. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Go just, ahead, was, CJ. There's one part that's like really disturbing about some of these cattle mutilations. And isn't it that like the, usually the anus is gone too? Is that something that turkey vultures? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's, be held accountable that's a for? soft hole. <laughs> Exposed part. Okay. So we've <laughs> solved the problem. So, I mean, we, ha we had a cattle mutilation, cattle mutilation expert on our show. Who literally posited the idea that possibly some secret government agency was like lifting these cows with silent helicopters, taking them somewhere, cutting these organs out, and then dropping them off at other parts of the ranch. That, may, okay, maybe, maybe, but certainly turkey vultures seems a little bit more logical. They do really like dead cows. I mean, uh, that we also have a super endangered bird in the U.S. called the California condor, which you might have heard yes. of. I, yes. ap I applied one season to work with California condors uh, doing field research with them. And I got the job. And then the guy who hired me called me up and he was like, OK, I just want to have a conversation with you before you get all excited about this job. I, I want you to know that mainly what this job is, is backpacking cow carcasses up into the hills and leaving them there so that the condors could come down and eat them. <laughs> <laughs> and I considered that for about a week. And then that at the end of the week, I got another field job in Hawaii. So huh. I, mean, I took that one instead. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? I mean, yeah, dead cow carcasses or Hawaii. Well, look, How many I've... California condors are there? Sorry. They're huge. Yeah, they're, they're actually doing fairly well. The condor 
population. You know, they're captive breeding them now and re-releasing them into different places in the wild. And they're even releasing them around um, near Oregon in the Redwoods on the Northern California coast is one of the latest ones. So it's kind of exciting. We might actually see them flying around in the Pacific Northwest yeah. again. That would be neat. That would be exciting. And Noah, one of the things that um, I wondered about the uh, turkey vultures is that, you know, this could definitely be another area of consulting for you because like in Texas, the sheriffs have actual open cases investigating these cattle mutilations, right? And I feel like you would be a prime expert to call in and say, hey, this is potentially turkey vultures or not turkey vultures. Expert witness. Well, I have spent quite a bit of time looking at turkey vultures. <laughs> so I'm always happy to talk to anyone who's interested in in the potential vulture. Where I, this is a whole, I didn't realize that cattle mutilation was a thing. This is a section of the universe I've never experienced before. Oh, welcome to I my need universe. To do some no, uh, Googling. <laughs> yeah. I actually was, I struggled with that episode, preparing for that episode. I had heard about cattle, cattle mutilations before, just in terms of how they were related to belief in UFOs and aliens. And generally speaking, in areas where there is strange activity, there's also animal mutilations. Um, one of the shows that we had guests on from is The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch out in Utah, and they have all kinds of strange activity there and also animal mutilations. But the cattle mutilation expert had all sorts of theories on what was going on. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> New world for you. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that the Sheriff's Department posts these incredibly ominous pictures of cattle, like the, you know, the most ominous picture of a cow you've ever seen with the headlines, you know, of cattle mutilations and like blood red and, and, you know, we're going to get to the bottom of this and we don't know what's happening. And it's definitely not scavengers. They say because of whatever reasons, because, you know, they were only there, you know, for a very short amount of time or what have you. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's quite a big thing. Google it. I, th I think you might find yourself heading to Texas soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, it sounds very interesting. <laughs> so would this be a great time to pull up our first slideshow, CJ? Yes. Okay, well. As long as it's not dead cows. I don't think it is. And, um, I don't think there are any dead cows, but <laughs> Noah was kind enough to send us some pictures from some of his adventures, and we were hoping to just Yay, get I can't wait. your take on some of these. We should give our listeners your website while we're on this slideshow. So you've got lots of things out there, books, appearances, and it's Noah Stricker, S-T-R-Y-C-K-E-R.com. Yeah. You can go and find you. That was uh, on a beach in the Falklands. You can actually see a couple of penguins there in the background. Lower right-hand corner, out of focus. <laughs> okay. I oh, yeah, definitely thought that was like the wings of a bird and that you were in the snow somewhere. Uh, well, yeah. A cold place, but uh, doesn't have any okay. snow in that picture. Oh, that's a, even a little farther south. That's that is a cool place called South Georgia Island, which if you don't know anything about, that's another thing to Google because South Georgia is like being in another universe where you go on safari with elephant seals and king penguins and fur seals, just clustered all around you while you're there. It's um one of the most incredible wildlife places to experience on the planet where is it exactly oh south georgia is so if you go to the southern tip of south america you know the southern tip of argentina yeah. go southeast for about four days on a ship and you'll bump into <laughs> south georgia island <laughs> great okay sign me up <laughs> this is a very cool picture i'm dr mounts and i'm joined by cj derringer tonight we were talking to Special guest, birding expert, Noah Stricker. You can find out more about him at noahstricker.com. That's N-O-A-H, Noah Stricker, S-T-R-Y-C-K-E-R.com. And we're looking at a slideshow of some of his adventures right now. So if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, uh, and I'll describe these for those of you listening on podcast, Amazon, Google, Spotify, Apple, etc. We're looking at Noah Stricker on some of his adventures, and this is just a bleak snowy landscape here that you said was south georgia island noah that's it and moving on here 
Next, we've got what appears to be Noah holding a baby penguin, I'm assuming. You, you got it. This was my first adventure straight out of college. So I studied biology basically at Oregon State for my undergrad. And then right after I graduated, I got hired as a, an intern field tech scientist on a penguin research project in the Ross Sea. So it's through the U.S. Antarctic program. You fly through Christchurch, New Zealand. From there, get on a U.S. Air Force cargo jet and they fly you down to the ice. You land literally on the frozen surface of the ocean at McMurdo Station, which is the biggest base in Antarctica. It's got about 1,500 people there in the summer. But I didn't spend long there because I got on a helicopter with two other penguin researchers and they flew us out to this camp in the middle of nowhere where I slept in a tent for the next two and a half months with no shower, no fresh food, <laughs> no way to like wash my clothes. <laughs> and oh, we had man. about 300,000 penguins right outside. And it was just magical. That, that for me started a whole love affair with Antarctica and the polar regions in general. And I think I've been on about 70 expeditions to, to Antarctica I'm and the sorry, Arctic. How many? Uh, 70, more or less. I don't know. I haven't counted. 70. <laughs> wow. That's wild. I mean, that's wild considering all of the other things you've done as well. Like if that was all that you did, okay, that, that would make sense. But given that you've been so many places, you just get ice in your veins after a while. It gets in your bloodstream. And I mean, yeah. look at that. You pick up a baby penguin and they are I do it. just yeah, I as soft as they look. They're like little beanie baby toys, oh. except they've been you know, crammed so full of food by their diligent parents that their bellies are pretty full. So you usually want to pick them up with the back end facing away from you. Yeah. <laughs> for That's true of real reasons. babies too. <laughs> and for yeah. those listening on the audio version of this, this baby penguin does not look like what you typically think of a penguin looking like, right? It's kind of furry and solid black. Yeah, they hatch out with this layer of down that they have for about the first month of their lives. And it means they're not waterproof, so they can't go in the ocean yet, but they're perfectly warm on shore. And then when they get to be almost the size of their parents, then very quickly they lose those downy feathers and they have their swimsuit on underneath their first layer of adult feathers mm -hmm. that's waterproof. And then they can go out for a swim all on their own. Cute. It's really adorable. Oh, this was uh, during my big year on a brief stop in Bali <laughs> looking for shorebirds. <laughs> that was getting on toward the end of the big year adventure. So I was, uh, I probably Tired. was up to like 5,000 birds or so at this point and looking for uh, just a couple of birds in Bali on, a, on an overnight stop before I continued on to Papua New Guinea in Australia at the end of the year. Did you find the birds you were looking for on this stop? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of shorebirds on that mud flat out there in the distance. I mean, you mentioned earlier that birding is a great way to travel, and it is, and it's amazing. You see the world one bird at a time, and it takes you to places that you wouldn't normally go maybe as a tourist all the time, which is usually awesome because you're going to, you know, off the beaten track kind of places and meeting the locals, et cetera, et cetera. It does kind of take you to some places that maybe people wouldn't normally want to go to, like sewage yeah. ponds and landfills and <laughs> squeaking mud flats, but that's where the birds are. <laughs> yeah, this does look like a very mucky place to be standing. Like your feet were probably sinking into this landscape. It was great. That's uh, that's me in paradise right there. <laughs> <laughs> you look pretty happy. Yeah, and this is during Noah's big year, which is the year he set a world record for seeing over 6,000 bird species. And CJ, did you hear that? He was on his way to Papua, Papua New Guinea. Yes, I heard it. Thank you. Yeah. Moving on. Potentially where Avi Loeb, a frequent guest of ours, may have found extraterrestrial existence in the ocean. So, moving oh, wow. on. Tim and I had a debate on how to pronounce the name of that country, which is why he's bringing it up. <laughs> and he was right. Yes. Papua, let's go. All right. So look next, we've got, oh, here's some, are these baby, oh, these must be juveniles, so right? Yeah, you got it. Those are baby emperor penguins. Oh. Emperors are the biggest penguins. Mm. If you've ever seen the movie Happy Feet, yes. this is yeah. Mumble from Happy Feet, basically. They are 
super cute. I think they are the cutest baby penguins because they have that black and white pattern on their head. Mm -hmm. To be continued. Thanks. Like. Share. Follow. Comment. Subscribe. Support. What's your hot take on Travis Taylor? <laughs> it, I've got an exclusive for you guys if you okay. want it about yeah, the Alaska. Absolutely. We do. Okay, okay. More at BigfootUFO.com. All things unexplained. So some of that I think, sir, will save for post session.